The NCAA tournament is like Christmas time in the Shade household. It's my favorite time of the year, and it's perfect just the way it is. So why on earth do we keep trying to mess with it? We're going to have to figure that out. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, October 21st, 2022. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making our show your first listen or your first watch every single day. Please don't forget that we're free and available anywhere you get podcasts, so you can subscribe right now to make sure you don't miss a second of your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Underdog. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with the promo code locked on and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Folks, special treat today on the show. We are joined by Riley Davis, national writer for the Field of 68 Daily, part of Heat Check CBB, and spoiler alert, a North Carolina graduate, but we won't get uh, too much into that today. So we're going to look, as I alluded to in the cold open, Man, there's some stuff going on with NCAA tournament expansion. Again, we got to just thwart that right in its track. We're going to talk about the upcoming season for the Tar Heels and a bigger, broader look at college basketball landscape itself. Riley, so great to have you in. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Isaac, thanks for having me on. I've been a fan of your show since probably discovered it this summer, maybe listened to some episodes and some preseason stuff you did, even like back in July and August when there are probably very few people actually, you know, thinking about college hoops, but I know UNC fans always are. So glad to, glad to be on the show for the first time. So yeah, thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. So yeah, folks, Riley and I text and talk a lot, just always enjoying bantering back and forth about college basketball and the Tar Heels and all sorts of stuff. And so uh, this has been in the works for a while and we're excited to be together. So Riley, we got all the media days going on for the various conferences right now. And so we're getting lots of interesting uh, blurbs and, and quotes and stuff out of that. So let me throw a few at you about tournament expansion and then let's talk about it. So Yesterday, or excuse me, on Wednesday, Mizzou's head coach Dennis Gates said about the tournament, I would like to see it double. You kidding me? To be honest with you, there are some great coaches left out of the tournament and some great players we don't get to see. Uh, we've heard ACC commissioner Jim Phillips and SEC commissioner, uh, maybe the most one of the most powerful men in college athletics, Greg Sankey, both publicly talk about wanting to expand the tournament. Commissioner Phillips said the time is now as we're looking at the overall structure of the NCAA. So I'm in favor of looking at it, meaning NCAA tournament expansion, and I really would like us to expand. Riley Davis, I think this is an awful, terrible, no good idea. Where are you at on NCAA tournament expansion? Uh, well, I'll start by saying I would rather there be expansion than shrinking it. You know, like I know there were rumors about kicking out all the mid and low majors and just making it a power conference invitational, which I'd be very against that. Uh, but when it comes to these certain coaches who've been weighing in, like take Dennis Gates, for example, like you, he was the first who you mentioned. I understand why Dennis Gates is advocating for an expanded <laughs> tournament. <laughs> and His I, job's I think, on the line. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that Dennis Gates – was a pretty good hire by Mizzou. And I, I think just looking at what he did this summer and this off season sort of cemented that they, they made a smart hire. And I, I think I'm really excited to see what Isaiah Mosley does this year for them. And he's, you know, has basically been a, a 50, 40, 90 guy who flew under the radar because he ended up going to Mizzou, Mizzou uh, committed, right. <laughs> committed to a, a, middle of the pack to bottom tier SEC team. But I actually think Mizzou could be a little bit better than maybe they're getting credit for this preseason. Uh, so anyway, all that is to say, I see why Gates is doing it. But me personally, like I would prefer for it to stick with 68. Uh, not that I have enough sway within the field of 68 to, to, <laughs> to litigate some sort of a name change, but I would guess, you know, that would have to happen if that was the case. So we'd be happy if we got to keep our name with that. But, uh, you know, the big thing, if it ever were to expand, and like I said, I'd love for it to stay at 68. I, I really enjoy the, the way the structure is. I would like to see it bring in more mid-majors uh, as opposed to just bringing in like bad power conference teams. Absolutely. Like as, as guys who watched the ACC all last season, like were you really dying to see one more Syracuse game or see, <laughs> were you, were you ready to see? They're exciting, you know? 
were you ready to see 11 win NC state get a chance or, or a suddenly resurgent Boston college? Like I, I didn't really need to see those teams in the tournament and that, that's how I've just am going to feel going forward. And absolutely. And if we expand, it's not like there's going to be more mid and low tier teams getting in. It's going to be average to bad major conference teams getting a shot. And, and uh, I believe commissioner Phillips even talked about that saying with expansion, like it's not that I want to see the AQs go away and that's a mm -hmm. good thing, right? We want to represent all 32 conferences. And I love that. That's part of the, the grandeur and the spectacle of the NCAA tournament. But that's what it's going to be is when we when we bring in more, it's just going to be middling at large teams that that don't do anything to move the needle on the NCAA tournament. And so I, I think there is a big thing here where like I've always been an advocate for AQs, automatic qualifiers should not be in Dayton for the for the first four. Like that should be all at large teams. And I think that that's what we're looking at is we're just going to keep bringing these in. Now, some of the some of the committee is talking about growing um, in, in all NCAA sports uh, by at least allowing 25% of the body in to whatever postseason that sport has. So for basketball with 363 teams, that would be right in the realm of um, like 90 ish or so teams. And so we might be looking at something where uh, teams seeded one through 32 get a buy and then teams. So that would be seeds one through eight. And then all the nine through 16s all have to play a first round. Like what, what does that do to the quality and the nature of the tournament as we know it, Riley? Yeah, I think eh, not if you, when you put it that way, when I'm like, oh, teams one through eight seeds, one through eight, get a buy. I'm a little bit intrigued, especially because yeah. UNC, you know, more and, that, often and that's than just not, the math I'm doing on it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hadn't really thought about that as a potential solution, but I don't know. I still 90 to me seems like too many. I think, it, this would even, I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about the almanac at some point on this podcast. Yes, absolutely. Something We're can, getting to it. Something I contributed to, but just knowing <laughs> like we, we covered all 363 teams and you know, let's, let's be real. There's a chance that 363 might be too many D one teams. Like maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what needs to be, to be pared down a little bit instead of just expanding uh, the entire tournament field. And yeah, I, it's a it's a good question to think through, like how much of the product gets diluted, or I guess even if you if you open it up to more mid majors, are you going to see more upsets? Probably. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing unless they continue again through into the second weekend, because you know, I think media folks like myself, we always say you, you cheer for the upsets on those first two days, but once you get to the and Sweet then you Sixteen, want the big dog. that's right. Yeah, let's let's get the good teams for the Sweet Sixteen, Elite Eight, Final Four, et cetera. Um, and again, if it is like we've already touched on, if it, if it expands to more middling to bad power conference teams, I mean, I'll probably have that on in the background, but, I, but it's not, it's, just, it's not appointment television, right? It's not that same sense of magic. You feel that first Thursday where it's like, Oh, as soon as, as soon as that clock hits noon, I'm not doing any work. I'm doing whatever I can to get out of work. And I'm probably going to watch basketball till midnight. Uh, yeah maybe have a, a nice little walk around the neighborhood as a palate cleanse around like seven or eight, just to, right. <laughs> to make sure, my, to make sure my brain's still working, make sure my legs still work. But yeah, that's, that's, that's what I, what I don't want to lose, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they structure it for sure. Yeah. And I mean, you even talk about the second weekend. What, what would that even mean now if we have a, a seventh round essentially? I mean, I know we right. have that in Dayton that happens Tuesday and Wednesday leading into things, but, um, uh, uh, what what is that even going to be? And so here's what I'm wondering. Maybe this the problem isn't with the size of the NCAA tournament. Maybe the problem with, is with the size of D1 at 363. Is it how what would your thoughts be on investigating the idea of splitting D1 at you know at some level, um, similar to what football used to do and, and still has with FBS and FCS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would make sense. Again, I don't I don't mean that as a slight to any athletic departments out there but i just i mean hearing about like even through the almanac with work i did this year and hearing about how many programs there are that just get completely funded through their their money games in the in the fall i, I could see why that would make sense although i'm sure none of the coaches or players would want to be relegated to like a perceived lower level uh but it would it would more so be yeah just seeing like i mean there probably are there are some d1 teams who are ranked 
you know, probably those teams 340 through 363 on Kim yeah. Bomb where where you gotta win. IU IUPUI, ooey yeah. pooey Jaguars. They're 363 right now. <laughs> is it really worth them playing in D1 another year? Or I mean, but then again, we said the same thing about Chicago State two years ago, and it seemed like Chicago State was gonna get relegated That's- and down to D2. And they made a good hire and won a couple games in the WAC last year. I want to say they beat New Mexico State, who ended up getting the the automatic bid. So with, with some of these schools, it's like I think from my perspective as a fan of a of a power conference school of a blue blood, as someone who covers the sport, and it's like, yeah, I'd be I'd be happy if there was like sixty less teams to write about for the almanac. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I can see like that why these fans or alumni in different schools why they still are able to hold out to hope. Um, I mean, because. Yeah, for years, it seemed like for probably at least five years, maybe longer. I'm not super well versed in the Chicago State history, but it just seemed like they, they were always uh, they always maintained that last spot on Kim Bomb year after year. That's right. Made Down there with NJIT. And, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 there even becomes this question, and we don't have to litigate this, but like if we expand uh, for forever, there's been this metric by which coaches are measured of like, did you make the NCAA tournament? How often, mm-hmm. et cetera. Does that continue to be that metric or it, with the dilution, does it even become a special attainable thing? Or is it just like, Oh, congrats. Way to go. You're still fired. You know, like yeah. I, I think that is, is a big question when it comes to coaches trying to keep their jobs is, is that our, our bar by which we measure success anymore Mm -hmm. anyway it's a whole conversation riley and i are going to be keeping a lot of tabs on throughout this college basketball season as these conversations continue to happen and conference commissioners try to get all 80 million of their conference schools in to the big dance folks specifically for north carolina there are big expectations ahead this season but are they going to live up to them will we see the tar heels from the first two-thirds of last season or the tar heels from the last third we'll ask riley all about that right after i tell you more about underdog this episode is brought to you by underdog fantasy the easiest place to spice up the college football season it's easy to get started and easy to play while you watch your favorite team in fact i've created my own account with underdog and while the tar heels aren't playing this weekend i'm going to be looking around for some other over under options to fill out my pick them slip you can go to underdog yourself to make your own picks just like me it's easy to play and available in over 30 states just pick between two and five players across any team any sport doesn't just have to be the tar heels and decide if they will finish higher or lower than the stat given it's one of the easiest fantasy games to play out there and you can win cold hard cash in a single game so sign up with promo code locked on one word and underdog will double your first deposit up to 100 deposit 100 get 100 free go to underdogfantasy.com or find the underdog fantasy app in the app store or google play store that's underdog fantasy promo code locked on all one word get in on the college football pick them action today All right, Mr. Riley Davis, your alma mater, the North Carolina Tar Heels, are in store for a potentially big season. The 10th time in program history, they have been preseason AP number one. Uh, Four of the previous nine times, they've made it to the final four when they've been in that position. So history says it should be a good year. Here's my question for you to start this out. Which UNC team do we see? Is it the team that middled and struggled a little bit the first two thirds of the season, or is it a team that lost to Pitt and then ran the gauntlet just about the rest of the way of the 21, 22 season? Yeah. I mean, this probably won't surprise any you and any of your UNC listeners out there. I'm assuming 95% of not hundred percent are <laughs> UNC fans. And I'm going to, I'm going to stake my claim with Hubert. I mean, I think they figured something out after that, after that Pittsburgh game. And uh, generally speaking, I'll cite analytics. You know, I'm more so of a vibes guy. I like to go off of, you know, what I see, what kind of vibes I'm getting. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Not necessarily like just getting straight into the numbers. I'm not quite like that, but I still got some numbers for you. So uh, using Bart Torvik, who uh, his analytics, you can filter by date and filter by game. And starting after the pit game, that day afterwards is February 18th. From that game through the end of the season, UNC played like the third best team in the country, which is a pretty big, uh, pretty big sample size. But even if you even if you filter out the NCAA tournament, Carolina played like the 13th best team in the country for those last 
uh, two weeks, uh, two two weeks to the rest of the the postseason with the ACC tournament, and just for fun, I filtered out that loss to Virginia Tech in the ACC tournament. And before <laughs> that, before that, it was a six game sample size where they play like the fourth best team in the country per, per Bart Torvik's metric. So yeah, I I mean I do think like to expand on that a little bit, I think they figured something out around that time where uh, of course you're always going to have a transition time when you replace a legend like Roy Williams, first time head coach who had only coached I think at the JV level if I'm not mistaken, I've coached the UNC JV team with Hubert, but have you know, been on the bench the, the previous nine years to where I could see how there be that, that sort that period where it's always going to be tough to, re- to replace a figure like coach Williams. And then on top of it too, I think Hubert to me, at least it looked like he changed up the defensive scheme. And I'm sure you remember, I'm sure your listeners remember that we were just a sieve on that end of the floor, like pretty much until, early February and then backtracked it backtrack to that again in, in the Pittsburgh game. And I think they figured something out on the defensive end. And when you bring back four of the five starters, including your best defense, your best all around defender uh, and someone like in, in leaky, and then someone like Armando who can sort of anchor the paint, but has enough enough to him where he can slide his feet on the perimeter and switch. Uh, I think the defense should stay at a pretty good, a pretty good yeah. level. I'm, I don't know if there'll be like a top, you know, top 10 or top 15 unit in the country, but I would be 0% surprised if UNC finishes 20 to 25th in defensive yeah. efficiency on Kim Palm. Yeah. And given what the offense should be, that should be enough to uh, carry right. the water there. And plus you expect Pete Nance to be a better all around defender than was mm-hmm. Brady Manick with all due respect. He held his own like against Bancaro and in some of those mm-hmm. other matchups, despite being uh, a less than stellar defender <laughs> all around. Now I'm going to be the one getting blocked on Twitter. Um, and so, uh, Riley, my next question for you is, as you look at this Carolina team, what are you know three or so major storylines you're watching for this season? Yeah, the first one, since you just mentioned Pete, uh, he's number one for me is for how, how, how will Pete Nance fit at UNC? And I'm super intrigued to see how Hubert uses him, both yeah. with like similarities and differences to Brady. And I think one of the main things we'll see is more uh, dribble handoffs when he's out on the perimeter and less pick and pops like they ran with Brady. Because, I mean, for those who, who didn't, wa- I, I'm not going to say I watched a ton of Northwestern last year, but I did my homework <laughs> on Pete Nance and we were recruiting him. Where I was like, all right, I'm going to watch a couple of his games. And he is an elite passer. I mean, his feel, his processing is off the charts. Like he is an absolute playmaker from the top of the key, from the elbow. Like I really want to see, I would love to see Hubert use him, sort of like run the offense through him in spurts. And I think having him as a decision maker on the perimeter, running those dribble handoffs with RJ, uh, with Caleb, that's something that we didn't see a ton of last year, even though like Manic was a good passer. I mean, he's a smart player, but I think Pete's just a different level when it comes to being able to facilitate. So, uh, and so it'll still be some of those same NBA concepts that I think Hubert sort of, you know, made his name with and, uh, brandished himself to recruits as that way or branded himself uh, to recruits in sort of this, you know, new era of Carolina basketball. But I would bet we see more dribble handoffs uh, as opposed to pick and pops with Pete. Yet at the same time, I think Pete's a good enough shooter to where you can't just leave him wide open out there. Absolutely, because he'll hit it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with Caleb and with RJ on ball, he's going to get a ton of open threes if we do run pick and pops. <laughs> like that's still going to be effective. I just bet we won't see see – him attempting nearly as many threes as Brady attempted last year. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, absolutely. And then storyline number two would just be Caleb loves efficiency. Uh, that's yeah. something where yeah. I, I wonder, you know, some of it is, I think that's who he is as a player is he's going to get those shots up. And I like that in him because you see how it works out when he's on. I mean, you take that trade off anytime. Like if you're going to go, what was it? I think he was like, probably two for 14 against Syracuse in that game until he flipped the switch late last season before Something like that. Yeah. Before scoring like 10 or 11 straight points. Like you'll live with those nights. It's if it means you get the nights like UCLA and like UCLA game. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I'm just more so seeing, can he at least clean up the shot selection some to where it's not just, you know, uh, pulling up from mid range and transition or uh, maybe driving with, without much of a purpose or a plan. And, and is he able to take better angles to the basket when he's, when he's slashing to the hoop? Like that's, that's what I'm most intrigued to see. Cause, and I think we will, we, 
theoretically should see an uptick in, in his efficiency, even if he is going to, you know, take some questionable shots that he can make, but they're still questionable at times. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm a big Caleb fan. I've been a believer in him since he was a freshman. I thought, you know, even his freshman year when we were pretty mediocre, there were ways where I thought he was battling on defense. And uh, even though, again, like that, that team wasn't anything special. And I, I, I thought I saw something there and it was awesome to see it materialize more last year, but yeah, just kind of entering his junior season. I do think we'll see a little bit of an uptick in efficiency. Uh, and then I'll oh, go ahead. No, you're good, man. Keep going. I was just going to say the last storyline of, of the three that I'm most intrigued with would also be how Hubert uses the bench in year yes. two. Yes. Um, and I, I think, don't get me wrong. When we get to March, I am 100% okay with him playing a seven or eight man rotation. I think even if it's seven men where you have your starting five and you got a change up guy in the backcourt, which I'm assuming is going to be Seth. Seth Yeah. Yeah. And a different, a different look in the front court, which I'm assuming will be puff. I think you're golden with that. And, you know, maybe Justin or Don Trez will get spot minutes here or there. Like if, you know, you want to have guys ready to go in case of an injury, but if that's what we're rocking with, I'm cool with it. And especially like, Again, I I have to preface by saying I love Roy Williams. I rarely, if ever, <laughs> criticize Roy Williams. But this so this might but. sound like a little bit of criticism. <laughs> but I love Roy. I will always go to bat for Roy. But it felt like for years, you know, we were begging him to play his best players. Like, Roy, come on, trim down this rotation sub. Uh, I even think back to like 2016, 2017 season and like the non-conference portion. Every time Luke May was on the floor, I was like, oh my gosh, what, what is this dude doing in there? And of course, Coach Williams knows more than me, hence why Luke May ended up becoming – Luke <laughs> May. Love it in Chapel Hill. <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah. <laughs> Hitting the biggest shot of the season. And now his family is like royalty at Chapel Hill. So, uh, of course, it, a lot of times it did work out for Roy, but I still think, you know, as, from a fan's perspective, we're like, come on, lean a yep. little bit more yep. on those best players. It's like, well, Hubert gave us that. But I, I do think this year, hopefully, we see him go to his bench a little bit more, and especially in the non conference portion. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, folks, we'll be watching out for all those things. How is Pete Nance used? on this team as stepping in for Brady Manick. What will Caleb Love's efficiency look like? And of course, will Coach Davis stay true to his word from this whole offseason about using more depth? Hopefully not to Coach Williams level, but somewhere in between <laughs> Hubert Davis year one and Roy Williams always. That's what we're looking <laughs> at. Uh, Riley, my last question, and then I want to transition into college basketball. Uh, the whole landscape of it is, what what freshman for North Carolina do you think will have the biggest impact? Obviously, we've got there's a four-person class with with Will Shaver, who's been there this whole year since enrolling in the spring, along with Seth Trimble, Jalen Washington, and Tyler Nickel, the self-proclaimed four-level scorer. <laughs> yeah, as much as I love T-Nick, and I know he's generated buzz with his play, both in the live-action scrimmage uh, and his play in the NIL scrimmage they did, I, I want to say it was back in September, yep. uh, it's got to be Seth. He's got it the has. easiest path. You know, there's going to be – 10 to 15 minutes backing up both guard spots off the bench. He has the highest pedigree as a fringe five-star recruit. Uh, I think it's Seth pretty easily. Uh, I don't know if we, we get to see T Nick unleash much until year two. And uh, hopefully Jalen Washington can get some good minutes in the non-conference. Cause you know, I'd be surprised if he gets much more than like maybe five a game for ACC play. Cause I, I, I do think thinking about, you know, well, I'm only really focusing on this year because we got a great chance to win a natty. But thinking about the the following year, if Carolina wants to rely on Jalen Washington for close to starters minutes, they got to Huber's got to find some time for him this year, assuming yep. he's healthy. Yep. Yeah. What's, what's your take, Isaac? I, I feel minute? the same way. I think, um, especially given like just how many minutes. Caleb and RJ have both logged on their legs, just trying to do as much load management as possible there. Uh, I think exactly how you said it. Seth has the most obvious and logical path to playing time. Plus Jalen Washington's like, when is he fully ready? I know he's cleared now, but uh, being cleared and being game ready are two very different things. And uh, Tyler Nichols defense just isn't where it needs to be. He's going to have some microwave minutes where he might just come out and drop eight in quick succession, but then get, 
burnt like Kerwin Walton level ugly units <laughs> in defense. And uh, and then Will Shaver's just not ready. And so, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm right with you. I think Seth Trimble is the, the clear front runner for most impact freshman for this Tar Heel team. Great call yeah. right there with you, sir. And uh, boy, I, I just think that allows RJ and Caleb to just both go gangbusters when mm-hmm. they are in, knowing that they've got a not just – reliable but highly capable uh backup coming off the bench yeah i got a follow-up question to that you mentioned t okay. give me some microwave minutes i'm thinking i bet it's gonna happen there's gonna be a non-conference game this year where he gets in off the bench in the second half and just scores eight points in two minutes my question for you who do you think that'll be against oh my gosh <laughs> um it's gonna be like a random game in descent like not you know not right out of the gate but like coming off of the who do they play right after indiana it's like when everybody's just is it the citadel like, maybe yeah i like a game like that where it's just like all right man everybody's wasted we've just come home from portland just got back from bloomington and then all right <laughs> tyler go just have fun you know <laughs> like that's when it happens <laughs> I could see with the Citadel, they took a ton of threes last year. They were probably like top 10 in the country in three-point attempt rate. And they have a new coach this year in Ed Conroy. But uh, I talked to him this summer, and he said that they will still take a bunch of threes. So I could see that being maybe the type of game where, you know, I am sh- I would guess with the Citadel, we should we should beat – UNC should beat them pretty handedly, but uh, maybe the second half, you, you see Tyler Nickel get in there in a fast paced game, yeah. get up a couple threes, maybe splash a couple and get the UNC fans pretty excited about that. Yes. Yeah. People, as you said earlier, people are very excited. There's a lot of buzz about Tyler Nickel, but uh, folks, just temper those expectations. It's year two and three for Tyler, where he will really shine. That, that wing uh, position is loaded with guys in front of him. So uh, a lot coming, but man, I can't wait to see when that moment happens. Cause you know, it's going to happen where he'll just come out and, and splash a little bit. So uh, <laughs> while North Carolina is the AP preseason, number one, I want to know who's who Riley's top five are. We're going to talk about more about that right after I remind you that tomorrow, Saturday, October 22nd, we are doing a Final Four rewatch right here on the North Carolina Tar Heels Locked On page on YouTube. 4.30 Eastern Time, 3.30 Central. We'll be live chatting, uh, doing it all. you got to be subscribed to join the chat, so make sure you do that. And we'll be watching the game in real time. going to be a lot of fun. There's no football game, so we're going to fill your day with beating Coach K and sending him off into the sunset right here please make sure you join us oh and by the way we're doing a giveaway for a final four program in its original wrapping if you subscribe to the show this week so make sure you do that all right mr riley davis as he's alluded to folks riley was part of putting out this insanely huge exhaustive the almanac that came out just a few weeks ago it's great i've got my own copy been pouring over it's got such great stuff content on every team this this crew that included uh, a collab of the field of 68 three-man weave verbal commits heat check cbb which riley's part of a couple of those um went and talked to every school every head coach and so just great behind the scenes information if you haven't already picked that up please make sure you go get it not only because it supports their hard work but just it's great content and is going to help you as a college basketball fan But Riley, what I want to know is I know that the Almanac collectively picked Houston as the number one team in the nation. What is your personal top five? Yeah, uh, my personal top five. Well, when we voted for this for the Almanac, I voted UNC one, Houston two, Baylor Baylor three, Gonzaga four, and UCLA five. And I, I really wanted to put Houston number one. I did not want Carolina to be number one. I, I feel like the preseason number one rarely wins a national championship. And like I said, I want Carolina to win a national championship. <laughs> but as I looked at the two rosters, you know, I think Houston will probably finish with a better record. They play, they should run roughshod the through AC, the American. Yeah, the AAC, um, yeah. Yeah. Super well coached. Really respect what Kelvin Sampson's doing there. Like their defense is just an absolute. <laughs> I'm like, I, do I want to say it's a delight to watch? Because it's very <laughs> physical and they, <laughs> they just yeah, in, in a very up. different way than Virginia. Like it's not, <laughs> right, it's not Tony right. Bennett and what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, so yeah, I, I, I have a ton of respect for Houston and would not debate anybody if they ranked the number one, but I ended up rolling with UNC one. But 
I think since I submitted my initial top five, the more I've thought about it, I actually might lean Kentucky over UCLA for that fifth spot. Interesting. Even, what made you make that switch? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, part of it is seeing Kim Palm have <laughs> Kentucky number one in his preseason rankings. Uh, I mean, the man, the man's algorithms work. So uh, that's part of it. But even just looking more, more closely at the numbers last year, how good their offense was and how efficient it was for the majority of the season before Ty Ty Washington and uh, got hurt. And I can't remember if Kellen Grady was battling an injury down the stretch of the season too. Not too sure about that, but I know they had a couple injuries, but their, their offense just moved really efficiently and they bring back the national player of the year with Oscar. And again, like what, I know he's currently dealing with. I was going to say, yeah, injury. he's a little banged up right now. Yep. Yeah, that's that is the one hesitation I would have to putting them surefire at number five is uh, we we won't know for sure where Oscar's at until we see him, you know, roaming around the court on opening night, and then again a week later in the Champions Classic. I'm really curious to see how he does there and what how how healthy he is. But um, just reading reports from the the pro day that that Kentucky had that apparently Oscar shooting threes now. And apparently their freshman like case and Wallace is supposed to be legit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm quite buying the Jacob Toppin hype yet uh, as a shooter. I think he's a super versatile defender, super bouncy, but he, he needs a little range if he's going to play the four next to she boy, just to, to help with that spacing. But yeah, I think I, I, I ended up swapping UCLA with UK just because I, I, I think that UCLA, their depth isn't, quite top five good but right yeah, yeah absolutely and, and team. absolutely and because tiger campbell is like a, one of the most legit true point guards in the nation like hands mm-hmm. down but like can jaime Hawkes carry carry things right now that he is probably going to be more so the guy than he had been uh that's a big question for me and mm-hmm. with i think part of what gives me a little bit of pause with houston is as good as marcus sasser should be is, is he fully go coming off a big injury last year? Uh, really curious to see what happens as game action picks up and you get the Knicks, is the Knicks mm-hmm. and bruises. But, man, defense travels. We know that, and that's Houston's calling card, as you yeah. well said. Love that rally. Man, going to be fun. Should be a lot of good teams at the top, and that, that's what makes for a good college basketball season, in my opinion. Now, we've got a lot of those front runners, but I want to ask you, on the backside of that, who are some dark horses you're watching out for this season? Yeah, San Diego State's the first that comes to mind. That's they are ranked right now. I want to say both Kim Pom, Bart Torvik, Evan Miyakawa, all of their metrics have San Diego State pretty high to where it's not like a super dark horse by any stretch. But I'm saying more so for maybe the casual fan who's not as as informed on what they might do. That San Diego State, I'm pretty sure, had the number one ranked defense last year. Uh, they play a tough pack line scheme, and on top of it, they have one of the games I will say like one of the most underrated playmakers in the country and Matt Bradley, who's just a mm. six, four, two twenty pound wing who basically can, can run the point for them, makes a ton of tough shots, takes a bunch of threes off the dribble and hits them at a pretty high level. And they also added Seattle transfer, Darian Trammell, who's probably only five ten, five eleven, but is an absolute two way beast and fit right into what they want to do on defense and also be able to provide some of that secondary playmaking alongside Matt Bradley. So uh, again, they kind of, they just have that model of a, a, what's going to be a top three defense in the country and they can get enough on offense to where uh, they should be able to go pretty far in the tournament next year. Uh, And aside from them, as far as like unranked teams that I think could end up uh, being the type of teams to become nat- uh, nationally relevant all year or make a deep run in the tournament. I like both the Florida schools, both Florida and Florida mm-hmm. state, I think should be pretty good. Florida is one of those teams who uh, they got a couple versatile wings and Kawasi Reeves. In, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Colin Castle in the middle. Uh, Alex fudge I, was just a random dude who I loved when he was at LSU. <laughs> I think he averaged like three points per game last year, but his just some of the blocks he had, like as a weak side rim protector, he's, probably like six, eight, six, nine, I want to say long arms, good athlete. And hopefully he can average maybe like 10 points a game this year. But I think his, you know, his instincts as a defender should help that Florida unit be really good, especially with Castleton continuing to block a ton of shots in the paint. Um, Then Florida state. I mean, we've just seen them be a model of consistency under Leonard Hamilton, where they're, they're always in that 15 to 20 range aside from last year where they suffered a ton of injuries. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. Yeah. like, I mean, I, I, I covered the, the Duke Florida state game in Cameron last year in February and 
Florida State actually hung with Duke in the first half. They they had the lead for most of it before Duke went on a little run to take the lead. Right. But they literally were playing a walk-on Harrison Preto. I don't know if you remember that game, but I think he played 20 minutes that game. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, but so I'm I'm buying Matthew Cleveland year two big time. Mm, so boy. Yeah. Yeah. Any it feels like anybody that comes off of Leonard Leonard Hamilton's bench is either seven feet tall or can just get in and, and make plays. And it's just yeah uncanny how he can do that year after year after year so uh folks love those dark horse candidates there in san diego state it feels like the universe just owes them a solid after missing out same with dayton in the 2020 right. season and so uh really hope good things for them this year my final question for you today mr riley davis is uh in a year where we're looking at man you could legitimately and i think like rothstein has five bigs five true centers on his first team all-american ballot uh if you're looking at this season who are your first team all-americans preseason yeah uh thank you for setting me up quite nicely to give another plug for the almanac <laughs> that is literally <laughs> subtitled the year of the big if you that's right you know, there you go it, if you are on college basketball Twitter, there's a great chance you've seen a tweet promoting the almanac. But <laughs> so even if you just Google it or go on my timeline, you'll see me promoting it. There's a link there. Best 20 bucks you'll spend all off season. Uh, but we have all the best bigs on the cover and did a whole feature article that Rob Doster did with from talking to Hunter Dickinson, talking to Armando, talking to Oscar, uh, just about what it, why we're calling this the year of the big. So I do have the big three bigs on my first team with Drew Timmy, with Oscar Shibwe, with Armando Baker. I think even regardless of how you like your all American teams, if you like having those concrete <laughs> positions, like you right. just can't, you can't leave one of those three off. It's, it's just, you'll just feel wrong. Uh, so that leaves the, the two other spots. So I picked Marcus Sasser for one of those mm -hmm. guard spots. Uh, I do think that yet yeah, I'm banking on him being healthy. And I think there's a good chance he'll be the best guard in the country if he's healthy. Uh, and the, the, the second, the second one I picked, will not make too many UNC fans happy, but I put Dariq Whitehead. And I know that that's a, a little bit controversial just because he might not even be the best freshman on his own team. Derek Lively <laughs> right, generated Derek a Lively, bunch yeah. of buzz. Yeah. yeah. And Tyrese Proctor is getting a ton of love right now too. But I, I think that Duke almost always has a first team All-American. So I'm kind of just banking on precedent and history. And I just loved what I saw from Whitehead at Montverde. A super bouncy kid can make plays on ball. He's kind of one of those point wings, sort of like when they used to let RJ Barrett, you know, make reads and uh, run the offense through him to where, again, assuming that he is healthy. And I think Shire has been a little bit, a little bit vague, even with what his timeline is assuming he's healthy. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him put up like 16 points, five rebounds, four assists or something. And so he's, he's the one who I've sort of been, like banging the drum on all summer that like, this is the Duke freshman that I would buy hype around. Like other people are into lively some are into Proctor, but I, I think Whitehead will be the best. And uh, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I would love for Duke to struggle. I, I won't hide that <laughs> bias, but just being realistic. If, if we're in March, if, if it comes to be March and they're a one, two or a three seed, no one's going to remember if Derek Whitehead missed a couple of non-conference games in November if he's the best player on that team. So that's Absolutely. why I picked him as a as a first team All-American. Love it, love it. Hard how, to how hard about to you? Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I'm I'm right with you. Those big three, I I tend to agree. I would leave off. You know, I think the other two bigs most people would have in that conversation are Hunter Dickinson and Trace Jackson Davis. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a couple guards I would take over them. Um, yeah. I, I know it's just chalk with everyone else but assuming his health which i i'm, I'm hoping he will be because you want to see the best players in the best health um that marcus sasser just given his two-way capabilities it just man it, it is hard uh to go against that in any way and so but then it's my fifth pick who I've, i feel like i've shuttled people in and out of that role all off season and so man i just i struggle with it riley to be honest with you with that fifth pick um, and so I think I'm hoping, you know, you want, again, you want all these kids to be healthy. So I hope Whitehead is healthy, but, um, gosh, man, a fifth. What about Nick Smith? He was someone I heavily considered. Dude, did it down from Arkansas. Yeah. Like goodness gracious. And that's close he's, to my neck. I'll actually get to go see him play in a little bit. So oh, that's um, awesome. He, he's one of the ones, yes, that I have definitely, um, had in and out. So let's go with Mr. Nick Smith, uh, riding the must bus a little bit here <laughs> and, uh, uh, go hogs. So yeah, let's go with Nick yeah. Smith is my fifth one. 
I had him on my second team alongside Caleb, alongside Isaiah Wong, which I feel I don't feel great about that. Um, yeah, I think I'm not that high on Miami. Yeah, I, I think their backcourt is being overhyped, uh, both mm-hmm. with Wong and Nigel Pack and everything that's going on with all the money and uh, whatever. Yeah, but I guess with Wong, I mean, he's like 24 or 25 years old. He's been there forever. And like, he is a bucket. And I think, you know, theoretically without McGusty there, I mean, well, I mean, Nigel Pack's going to get those shots up, but right. I don't know. Wong could be a big time scorer. And if, but he he needs Miami to live up to expectations for him to make the second team, I think. Absolutely. And I think a lot of that is who is he without Cam McGusty? That's what I've been waiting to see all offseason. Cause dude, McGusty to me is just an absolute stud. And yeah, can awesome. can Wong carry that water without him, basically, is what mm-hmm. I'm wondering. I'm not I'm with you. I'm not necessarily sold on it. Um, but we'll see. And Coach L, man, he he gets them going. And Miami's always a tough. Always a tough out, just like Florida State. And so yeah, um, sure. they'll compete and work really hard at that. So, uh, man, ladies and gentlemen, it's been so great to have Riley Davis on today, finally making this happen. We'll have to do it more often as we get into college basketball season, talking about both the Tar Heels and the national college basketball landscape and everything going on. Brother, thank you so much for joining us. Folks, that's it for this week on Locked on Tar Heels. Thank you so much for joining in with another week. We're another week closer to the college basketball season. Keep in mind the Tar Heel football team is off this weekend, but don't forget to join us for our Final Four rewatch. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. You can follow Riley at Riley underscore Davis 3. You can follow me at Isaac Shade. Coming up next week, UNC cornerback Tony Grimes is going to join me on the show. Coach Pat Kilby and I are going to bring you our ACC preview for the season. Can't wait for all of that. Get more on the ACC by making Locked on ACC your second listen of the day. Host Candace Cooper and the local experts of Locked on take you around the conference in 30 minutes, five days a week. Listen, Riley and I, we hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy the time, whatever you do, getting ready for another week. Uh, uh, Pitt is up next for homecoming next weekend for the Tar Heels, so get ready for that. And we want to remind you that it is always a great day to be a Tar Heel. Until tomorrow when the Final Four rewatch. Peace.